Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the last day of campus party. Um, and welcome back to the Michelangelo stage. Our next two sessions, uh, the morning will be more or less um, dedicated towards design topics. And our first presenter is um, Neil Mecca. He's Australian, but lives and works here now in Berlin and runs the Renum <laughs> Performance Company, which is an automot automotive design consultancy. So he will give us a quite brief overview of computer technology and its use for automotive design. Stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you for turning up this morning. Can you all hear me? No problem? Okay. My name's Neil Mecker. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Renin Performance. Our company operates as a automotive design and uh, automotive design consultancy specializing in high performance cars <clears throat> from Audi, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche and Lamborghini. In keeping with the theme of this event, my aim is to provide a, a overview of the advances in computer technology in automotive design applications. This isn't a detailed techni or technical insight into automotive design technology or car design, but it does explore the challenges and tensions that arise between good design and design developed through technology. This makes it relevant as a case study for industries that tackle, tackle similar issues. <clears throat> Europe is the place where the car was first invented and until World War I, most manufacturers were concerned with mechanical reliability rather than external appearance of car. Later, aesthetics became part of the automotive development process. Designs from each, each nation also had their own cultural identity reflected in the exterior and interior designs. World War II slowed this progress, but after the early 1950s, European designers set the trend and remained the driving force for many decades. While car design is a creative process, it also relies on a range of analytical processes. Car designers use a variety of, of design methods as part of the creative process. Processes that are commonly used are user research, sketching, comparative product research, and, ma and model making, prototyping, and testing. These processes are defined and determined by the designers, together with interrelated teams of specialists. The use of designers in the automotive development process also leads to added values through improved usability and more appealing vehicles. Some classic car designs are considered much of works of art as works of engineering. The 1938 VW Beetle, the 1970 Lamborghini Miura, which you're looking at right now, followed by Mar Marcello Gandini's masterpiece, the 1974 Lamborghini Countach, are noteworthy examples. And that's the one you're looking at right now. Another is the 1930s Mercedes-Benz 710SK Trossi Roadster. The last car Ferdinand Porsche designed before he started his own company. So as you can see, it was well ahead of its time. Ferdinand Alexander Porsche, the grandson of the founder of Porsche, was a revolutionary German automotive designer. And amongst other things, he designed the original and iconic Porsche 911. His father, Ferry Porsche, was responsible for designing its predecessor, the Porsche 356, which is the car you're looking at again right now. To quote Ferdinand Alexander Porsche, when you reflect on a function of a thing, its form sometimes arises as if it's, as, as if it's own accord. And that's quite an interesting aspect when you, when you look at the thing of the relationship between function and form. 
Today, automotive co designers often utilize 3D software, computer-aided design, CAD programs, to move from concept to production. Automotive designers may build a prototype first and then use industrial CT scanning to test for interior defects and also to generate a CAD model. From this, the manufacturing process may be altered to improve the vehicle. Characteristics specified by the designer may include the overall form of the vehicle, the location of details and with respect to one another, colours, texture and aspects concerning the use of ergonomics. The car designer may also specify aspects concerning the production process, choice of materials, even the way the car is presented to the consumer. In addition to considering aesthetics, usability and ergonomics, it can also encompass the engineering of objects, usefulness as well as usability, market placement and other aspects such as seduction, psychology, desire, and the emotional attachment the user has to the object. These values and accompanying aspects on which design is based can vary, both between different schools of thought and amongst practicing designers. Making form is what designers strive for, and car designers have a love of making shapes and forms. Making form is, is the serious part of a job of a designer and one that should not be left to the dictation of a function. Form follows function. Making form is about giving a visual sense of character to, a, to the product, of its story, beginning, and to make it soul. From this perspective, cars become art. Cars reflect who we are. At one time, all cars were designed on paper. Some of the greatest cars were designed this way. Each, each car begins with a single line, said Mandi, Marcello Gandini, designer of the Lamborghini Countach. By the end of the last century, paper seemed to be losing the battle against technology. Car design was already incorporated into a simultaneous design and development process that had engineers, manufacturing, logistics, and process experts reacting to every change a designer made on the computer screen. The single line, the one that Gandini, Gandini refers to, is using, still uses similar, we can still use similar techniques. And this has been transferred to, to software programs that allows, allow us to, to move them across different platform interfaces. Here is a, a short video of a concept design which are being created with Sketchbook Pro, Snap Pro X and Adobe After Effects.
Okay, thank you. So that is just shrink that. Now that that's um that particular il illustration you saw there of the uh, software um, that was sped sped up so it took two minutes. But the entire process you were looking at there took that particular person, that designer, uh, two hours from start to end. They were able to sketch the whole thing and finish off to pretty much complete a concept design. So it's quite amazing how when you bring that, that together, what can be achieved. Okay. So with car making heading, uh, inexorably towards digitization, a plethora of three-letter acronyms has entered the world of car design. Computer-aided design, CAD. Computer-aided manufacturing, CAM. Finite element analysis, FEA. And computational fluid dynamics, CFD, have all become part of the designer's toolkit. These ideas and the software have been imported directly from the aeronautical design world. The, the advantages are obvious. Get the entire vehicle development team working on a new car all at the same time, and new models get to the market much quicker. Powerful software tools such as Autodesk and Alias has allowed designers to put their ideas straight into digital language and then into milled shapes. And here's another video that demonstrates what can be done in Autodesk. I can't get no sleep. All completely computer generated. I can't get no sleep. As you can see, very realistic. You can see the level of detail just from the interior. Okay, however, creating cars this way can have its drawbacks, particularly when designed and developed using computer, computerized rapid prototyping or visualization tools. This process can result in cars that can look wooden, unresolved, or, even, or an angular, artless crossover. This is known as mass design. It's computer-aided design, but the emphasis should always be on the aided. This, this doesn't mean this technology isn't, isn't useful, 
but it's important to maintain a balance between sketchpad creativity and digital efficiency. An, inter an interaction of two-dimensional design and three-dimensional modelling to, to give us a digital design does provide an opportunity to remodel and refine ideas. That 3D data is also useful for, the man for manufacturing engineers, including surface line departments, to determine a specification of tools that need to be created to actually produce the car. What the data isn't very good at is communicating a design language. An example is the, is the Gina concept, which you're looking at on the screen right now. BMW experimented with a flexible skin during the development of the BMW Z4. This explores another philosophy of design, where material language can create its own shape, questioning aspects of shape definition. So if the materials that make the shape are different, for example, hard metal to cloth, we can discover different types of shape and material form. The shapes, forms and angles that emerged through this process were incorporated into the structural elements of the final design. And here is, a, here is another short video to illustrate what I'm talking about. Autos entwickeln sich ständig weiter. You left to excuse the commercial. Ich mit meinem Team, welche Elemente sind wirklich wichtig?
Okay. <clears throat> so this brings me to the point that I, that I raised earlier, that the values and accompanying aspects on which design is based can vary, both between different schools of thought and amongst practicing designers. For instance, from a design perspective, some people argue that sports and supercars reached their pinnacle in the 1960s. Supercars had achieved optimal aerodynamic efficiency while expressing a timeless elegance in their form. To look at, they sent a very clear message. Two examples from the late 60s include the Porsche 917, which you're looking at right now, and the one previous to this, which was the Ford GT. Here's what uh, Chris Bangle, former head of design at uh, the BMW Group, had to say about supercars at last year's uh, Geneva Motor Show. And just a bit of a warning, um, Chris Bangle is uh, quite a charismatic, outspoken guy who speaks his mind. So we'll see how you react to, react to his comments. Well, I'm kind of old school on supercars, you know, if they're, if they're not something that just, you know, knocks your balls off, you know, it's, they're nice cars, wow, they go fast too, you know, <clears throat> the world needs another one, oh, that's good. I'd like to see some design innovation come to if they're not going to be politically incorrect. If they're going to be politically incorrect and define some new limits of political correctness, then I say, fine, and then you're a supercar, you know, that's how they should be. You just look at it and go, ah, so, you know, that's a supercar. And it's been quite a while since, you know, one's hit me like that. But if they're just gonna be fast, then they have to have, to me, they have to have something more. You know, really fast cars, you know, fast, the look of fast, Porsche 917, GT40, you know, they did that, like, know, that 30 years ago, maybe a bit more. Okay, so that kind of look of fast, which has a lot of aerodynamics in it and everything like that, that's been around for a long time, right? I'd like to see a bit more story come out of these things, a bit more narrative. You know, what, what else can there be in this car that tells me this is the ultimate? Like, it doesn't get any more than this. <laughs> like those eight pillars? What do you make of... Um Lamborghini versus Ferrari's design um, now, and what would you liken them to? Well, I mean, in the bad old days, they were always, uh, you know, one is one you give to your wife, and the other you give to your <coughs> not mistress, okay? There's a, a lot more money involved than just mistress, right? And in a certain sense, it kind of says it all, because if you have a relationship with somebody, it's just pure sex and money. That's it, you know, just sex and money, okay? You can, you can go beyond some norms because you don't have to worry about the day after looking correct in church and you know and meeting her mom and that kind of stuff you're never gonna meet her mom right so that sense of ultimateness is reserved maybe for that one side of the coin on the other side if you're gonna do it as Ferrari has done with Pininfarina super for many many years you establish this sense of gentlemanliness a sense of we don't have to be politically incorrect to be the best right? We have a completely different side of the coin. And it's nice that there's space for two of these in the world. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's the point that, uh, a good point that Chris Bengal raised about the differences in de design language between um, some of the particular cars and some of the issues that, of saying that aerodynamic efficiency had, had, had reached its pinnacle already. But, cars, the, the language of cars have to be redefined and he was obviously talking about when he was asked about the difference between car companies like Ferrari and Lamborghini he was talking how one is a much more extreme version where one, one more or less relies on tradition which is reflected in the design language of these companies these, these days manufacturers of, of sports cars and supercars have to challenge themselves and express a design language that does embody many different things. But ultimately, they express the values of the companies and, the, and their designers. This is, one of our, this is one of our designs here. 
It's the, it's the Lamborghini's latest supercar, the Aventador. The, and this is our limited edition Corsa. Um, we've taken the form of this car, particularly its unique wedge-shaped design, and transformed these elements while creating additional contrast and features. Some car companies place greater reliance on computer-aided technology to, de to determine their designs. For example, the latest supercar that you can see here, the McLaren, the MP412C, has design features that are more dictated by function. Put, techni put technically, computational analysis of optimal aerodynamic efficiency. <laughs> the, as you can see, the front grille and the air intakes is, uh, are completely designed through computer analysis. Even, even the name of the car, the MP4-12C, seems computer generated. Whether the car exudes the emotion and unmistakable purpose, the human factor, something special and unique, that, that's something you can decide for yourself. So on that, on that note, I'll close by saying, paper and pencil are still at the heart of the design process, aided rather than dominated by computers. Thank you. Questions, right? Yeah, but um, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has. Yeah, any we have plenty of time for questions, so okay. don't be shy. I know it's very early; it's Saturday morning, but probably you want to know more about what Neil is doing. Sure. Yeah. When you, <coughs> when you start your work with the Ilias and... Sorry. <coughs> when you start your work with Alias and you're starting to go through um, designs using the sketching, how quickly are you able to alter electronic designs compared to a sketch design considering uh, all the factors you need to keep in contact because it's a bit of 3D modeling experience it's not as easy as sketching to rub out a line and start to correct play. correct um, I think that the the process of, of, of the sketching itself which is what I referred to in the in the presentation which is the the line the actual line that is created and <clears throat> that is really the character of, of, of a vehicle um, that, that gives it its unique, distinct features. So um, that particular process itself can, can be ongoing and ongoing, and a designer can sit there and spend so many, so many months, you know, re, re going, over, going over the lines. But once they actually capture a particular line and a, a particular feature, they can then transport that over into what you just saw, into that sketching technology. And with, the, with software that is, in, you know, interrelated, you can then manipulate that, do other things. When you, when you actually transfer something over into 3D software, that is quite complicated because um, you then build a complete 3D model, which is like the skeleton of the complete vehicle. And that is a very, very intensive process to actually sit there and redesign every particular line, every, every, every 3D dimensional aspect of the car. But once you actually do have that frame with every single element, every single, every single edge and every, every corner, it's once it's in the program, you can literally do whatever you like. And as you saw in the presentation in Autodesk, you saw the cars rotating in 3D. You can turn them inside out, you can turn them upside down. And from that, you can actually get any information you want and get a realistic perspective of, of what the car will actually look like before it goes into production. So, uh, yes, to cut, a lot, to cut my answer short, it does take quite a long time to get it to that 3D design. But once it, it, it is in that format, you can actually do a lot with it. And as you even saw, um, it's, ne it's now possible that companies are putting their concept uh, pictures as re releases of the cars because they're so accurate. Morning. Um, since you still use the sketchbook and the clay model, uh, I wonder uh, how much you give to virtual reality and all those, the, the hype stuff, because I did virtual reality for BMW 20 years ago, mm -hmm. which uh, flopped uh, tremendously. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it uh, did. 
do they do they, do they really use it? Because uh, it is said that Audi, BMW, Mercedes use high tech uh, cages uh, or uh, uh, VR uh, Google's all that stuff. But do yeah. they really use it, or do they just say, "Hey, we have it. We are cutting edge technology." That's a re that's a really good question. Um, what they actually do is there are particular studios who uh, some of them are based in the in the United States um, that have like uh, high scale 3D design projection uh, 3D layout in their studios. They're also available in Europe as well. So what you're seeing is when you have some of these 3D visualizations, they now can project them into a room. So what happens is, for example, if there's a meeting with the, the BMW group. If there's a new model they've designed, they can walk into this studio and actually walk around and, and sit there and, and, and look at the car from every angle, walk around it. So they actually do have that technology now. And, and that is, some, some companies probably use it more than others. Um, some of them see it as a way of getting a, a very good perspective. But in, consistent with what I said in some of my points in my presentation, there is always a difference between what you what you see that is computer generated, even if it's very close, you know, and even if you can walk around it and you can look underneath the car and you can you can see inside what the interior looks like. We, you know, we ha we are at that stage where we can walk around a car from a three D perspective. It's quite amazing, but I think you always need to balance all those elements of what something actually looks like in real life. Will it, will it, will a three D generated um, perspective? show you what you know uh the emotional factor of that car is you know that's only something that you, you you're going to, to to see or react to when something is in front of you you know so yes it, it, to answer your question it definitely is possible and it is happening and and some some car manufacturers use it more than others but you definitely can walk into a studio and have a complete um 3d perspective of a car and you can actually walk in when it's driving around the street and see it and you can walk it's just it's really so we are at that point right now it's quite interesting so the the point is uh, are they the manufacturers the the people like you really using these tools or is it just a management perk to show the management of hey look at that well that's you know i think you've answered some of the question um i think some of them will, will look at it from a perspective of saying this is a really good way for us to determine that the design is actually perfect and it works well. Whereas some of them have to, for example, they've spent three years working on a, on a particular model prototype. A lot of work, a lot of teams have put a lot of effort into this thing and they have to get the senior executive to sign off to, to produce this car. So um, it's like anything. If you, want, if you want to make a big impression and you want to get the project to go through, take them into a 3D studio and dazzle them with this amazing car. You know, where they can sit there and watch you taking corners and, and doing all sorts of things. So I think it's an element of both. I think it's an element of um, having the ability to see what this thing really looks like close up, but also to help promote uh, a vehicle before it actually is launched. Because to launch a concept costs millions and billions, you know. So, so yes, I think it does a, a combination of both. Um, in the future, who knows how much more we will rely on that sort of um, 3D technology for, for displaying cars. Another question? Maybe they can just talk join you after the talk okay. if somebody is too shy to talk no on the microphone. So okay. thank you, Neil, for thank the you. very great presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and listening. Thank you.